You already know that a living organism is a collection of organic molecules. All living organisms are composed of one or more cells, which are considered the smallest units of life. The compounds in a cell mostly consist of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. So, isn't it amazing that a living organism is made of non-living atoms and molecules? The study of the cell at the molecular level falls in the domain of biochemistry, which is a very important branch of biology. It is equally an important branch of organic chemistry too. In general, biomolecules are bigger and more complicated. So, let's quickly reinforce our knowledge of basic organic chemistry by applying it to these complex substances. Let's first define the term biomolecule. A biomolecule is a chemical compound that naturally occurs in living organisms and which are necessary for the existence of all known forms of life. For example, keratin. The main component of hair is an agglomeration of proteins based on molecular mass biomolecules can be classified into micromolecules and macromolecules micromolecules are biomolecules whose molecular weight is less than 1000 and include sugars lipids, vitamins, and so on. On the other hand, macromolecules are biomolecules whose molecular mass is greater than 1000, which includes proteins, polysaccharides, and nucleic acids. Sugars and proteins are essential constituents of our food. These biomolecules interact with each other and constitute the molecular logic of life. Carbohydrates are a vital source of the three basic necessities of life, that is, food, clothing and shelter. Carbohydrates constitute a very large group among various naturally occurring organic compounds. In nature, they are primarily produced by plants during photosynthesis. Some common examples of carbohydrates are cane sugar, glucose and starch. Carbohydrates got their name because historically they were considered to be hydrates of carbon. Carbohydrates are also called saccharides, from the Greek word saccharon for sugar. Many, but not all carbohydrates have the general formula CxH2Oy. For example, glucose C6H12O6. Its formula can be rearranged to fit the general formula. So, is CH3COOH considered to be a carbohydrate? Perhaps you recognize this compound as acetic acid. Its formula does fit the pattern, but acetic acid is a carboxylic acid, not a carbohydrate. The formula isn't enough to define a substance as a carbohydrate. To be more precise, we will define carbohydrates 
as optically active polyhydroxyaldehydes or ketones or compounds that produce such units when hydrolyzed. For example, glucose is a polyhydroxyaldehyde while fructose is a polyhydroxyketone. Carbohydrates can be classified based on their behavior during hydrolysis. These broad groups include monosaccharides, oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are the basic building blocks of all carbohydrates. Monosaccharides cannot be further hydrolyzed to give a simpler unit. About 20 monosaccharides exist in nature. Glucose, fructose, arabinose and ribose are some examples of monosaccharides. Oligosaccharides yield 2 to 10 monosaccharide units when hydrolyzed. On the basis of the number of monosaccharide units that are produced on hydrolysis, this group of carbohydrates can be further classified into disaccharides, trisaccharides, tetrasaccharides and so on. On hydrolysis, a molecule of a disaccharide yields two molecules of monosaccharides. In other words, a disaccharide is made up of two monosaccharide units. The monosaccharide units that are produced on hydrolysis may be the same or different. Sucrose, lactose and maltose are examples of disaccharides. On hydrolysis, a molecule of sucrose, commonly called cane sugar or beet sugar, produces a molecule each of glucose and fructose. But a molecule of maltose produces two molecules of glucose. Raffinose is a trisaccharide, while stachyose is an example of tetrasaccharide. Polysaccharides yield a large number of monosaccharide units when hydrolyzed. Polysaccharides which includes starch, cellulose, glycogen and many gums do not have a sweet taste. Hence, they are referred to as non-sugars. We often use the term sugar to refer to carbohydrates that have a sweet taste. In general, monosaccharides and oligosaccharides are sweet in taste and are therefore referred to as sugars. Everyday examples of sugars include sucrose found in cane sugar and lactose found in milk. Which of these structures is a monosaccharide? Which is a disaccharide? Can you identify an oligosaccharide and a polysaccharide? Molecule A is a polysaccharide. Molecule B is a monosaccharide. While molecule C is an oligosaccharide. Molecule D is a disaccharide. Carbohydrates can also be classified as reducing sugars and non-reducing sugars. Reducing sugars are carbohydrates that reduce Felling's solution or Tollens reagent. On the other hand, non-reducing sugars are carbohydrates that reduce neither Felling's solution nor Tollens reagent. All monosaccharides are reducing sugars. Sucrose would give negative results with both Felling's and Tollens test. Hence, it is a non-reducing sugar. Most disaccharides are reducing sugars and sucrose is unusual in this respect. 
Monosaccharides can be further classified into two major categories on the basis of the nature of the carbonyl group present as aldoses and ketoses. The term aldose is used to describe a monosaccharide that has an aldehyde group. The term ketose is used to describe a monosaccharide that has a keto group. For example, glucose is an aldose, while fructose is a ketose. Aldoses and ketoses can be further classified on the basis of the number of carbon atoms present as shown here. The prefixes tri, tetra, etc. with the ending os indicates the number of carbon atoms present. For example, glucose is a monosaccharide that has six carbon atoms with an aldehydic functional group. Hence, it is an aldohexose. Similarly, fructose is a monosaccharide that has six carbon atoms with a keto functional group. Hence, it is a keto hexose. Can you classify this monosaccharide based on the number of carbons and the functional group? First, by counting along the carbon skeleton, we see that there are seven carbon atoms, a heptose. This molecule is one of the few heptoses found in nature. This sugar contains a ketone group, so it is a ketose. Combined, we can fully describe this as a ketoheptose. Glucose is widely found in nature in the free as well as in the combined state. In the combined state, glucose occurs in cane sugar, starch, and so on. It is present in sweet fruits as well as in honey. Ripe grapes are also rich in glucose. Glucose is the monomeric unit of the larger carbohydrates such as starch and cellulose. Glucose is an aldohexose, which is probably the most abundant organic compound found on the earth. Glucose is also called dextrose because aqueous solutions of glucose are dextro-rotatory in nature. That is, an aqueous solution of glucose rotates plane polarized light towards right. Let's now see how glucose can be prepared in the laboratory and on a commercial scale. In the laboratory, Glucose can be prepared by the hydrolysis of cane sugar. An alcoholic solution of cane sugar or sucrose. On boiling with dilute hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid produces equal amounts of glucose and fructose. On a commercial scale, glucose can be prepared by the hydrolysis of starch. Starch on boiling with dilute sulfuric acid at 393 Kelvin under a pressure of 2 to 3 atmospheres produces glucose. Let's now study in detail the determination of the open chain structure of glucose. Glucose is known to have the molecular formula C6H12O6 as shown by elemental analysis and molecular weight determination. The next step is to figure out its molecular structure and absolute stereochemistry, which were very challenging tasks. Let's consider some evidence that helps scientists to determine the structure of glucose. For example, the reaction of glucose with hydrogen iodide Glucose on prolonged heating with hydroidic acid in the presence of red phosphorus results in the formation of n-hexane. 
the formation of N-hexane indicates that all the six carbon atoms in glucose are linked in a straight chain. The reactions of glucose with hydroxyl amine and hydrogen cyanide also provide similar evidence. Glucose reacts with hydroxyl amine to form glucose oxide, which shows the presence of a carbonyl group. Additional evidence supporting the presence of a carbonyl group is provided by the reaction of glucose with hydrogen cyanide. Glucose reacts with hydrogen cyanide to give glucose cyanohydrin. When glucose reacts with bromine water, a mild oxidizing agent forms gluconic acid which has the same number of carbon atoms as shown here. This is only possible if glucose contains a carbonyl group at the terminal position. That is, if the carbonyl group is an aldehydic group. Further, as the keto group doesn't respond to mild oxidizing agents, we can confirm that the carbonyl group is an aldehydic group. The acetylation reaction of glucose with acetic anhydride results in the formation of glucose pentaacetate. This indicates that five hydroxyl groups are present in a molecule. As the pentaacetyl derivative formed is stable, it means that the five hydroxyl groups are attached to different carbon atoms. The oxidation of glucose with nitric acid, a strong oxidizing agent, yields a dicarboxylic acid called saccharic acid. Gluconic acid also forms saccharic acid under these conditions. These reactions indicate the presence of a primary alcoholic group. Thus, based on these reactions, we can say that a glucose molecule has an aldehyde group and five hydroxyl groups, including one primary alcoholic group and secondary alcoholic groups. Hence, the open chain structure that can be assigned to glucose is as shown here. As this structure possesses four asymmetric carbons, there are 16 possible stereoisomers. Emil Fischer established the configuration of naturally occurring dextrorotatory glucose. It was truly an intellectual feat to identify which of the 16 possible stereoisomers of aldohexosis matched the structure of naturally occurring dextrorotatory glucose. Fisher won the Nobel Prize for this in chemistry in 1902. Fisher's projection formulae are widely used to represent the structures of carbohydrates. To assign the configuration of carbohydrate containing more than one chiral center, the lowest asymmetric carbon of a carbohydrate is compared to the configuration of an arbitrarily chosen standard, that is, dextrorotatory glyceraldehyde. Glyceraldehyde is chosen as a standard of reference as it is the simplest carbohydrate that has a single asymmetric carbon that shows optical isomerism. Shown here are the two enantiomers of glyceraldehydes. The carbohydrate or monosaccharide that can be chemically correlated to the plus isomer of glyceraldehyde is said to possess D configuration. And the carbohydrate or monosaccharide that can be chemically correlated to the minus isomer of glyceraldehyde 
is said to possess L configuration. That is, the compounds that are formed as a result of a reaction or a series of reactions from glyceraldehyde without breaking the bonds around the chiral center or any sort of other chemical correlation are assigned the same configuration as that of the particular optical isomer of glyceraldehyde. For example, the levorotatory lactic acid formed from dextrorotatory glyceraldehyde with D configuration is also said to have D configuration. It is important to note that D or L represent the relative configuration of a particular stereoisomer and doesn't hold any relation with the optical activity of the compound. To find the configuration of a monosaccharide relative to glyceraldehyde, compare the configuration of the lowest asymmetric carbon to the two glyceraldehyde structures as shown here. If the configuration of the lowest asymmetric carbon matches the spatial arrangement of the plus stereoisomer, that is, if the OH group is on the right-hand side, then the molecule is said to have D configuration. For example, the molecule shown here is D-glucose. This molecule is dextrorotatory glucose with D configuration. If the configuration around the lowest asymmetric carbon matches the arrangement of the minus stereoisomer of glyceraldehyde, that is, if the OH group is on the left-hand side, then the molecule is said to have L configuration. The molecule shown here, then, is L-glucose. This molecule is levorotatory glucose with L configuration. Here is a problem for you to try. Xylose and aldopentose makes up the polysaccharides present in corn cobs and the wood of trees and is chemically correlated to dextrorotatory glyceraldehydes. The two Fisher projections of xylose are shown here. What would be the configuration of xylose? We know that the plus isomer of glyceraldehydes is assigned the configuration D arbitrarily. By comparing the configuration of the lowest asymmetric carbon in xylose with this glyceraldehyde, we can assign the configuration D to xylose. We have already discussed the open chain structure of glucose on the basis of several reactions. However, it was observed that the open chain structure couldn't explain certain properties of glucose. However, these limitations were overcome by the establishment of the cyclic structure of glucose that was proposed on the basis of several experiments and X-ray analysis. Let us first look at certain important reactions that were not explained by the open chain structure. The open chain structure of glucose has an aldehydic group. Hence, it is expected to give a positive Schiff's reagent test. However, it doesn't. Note that in Schiff's test, an orange colored solution of fusion is prepared and then decolorized by reacting it with sodium bisulfite. If an aldehyde is added, such as acetaldehyde, then the solution will turn a vivid purple. Additionally, glucose does not form the hydrogen sulfide addition product when it reacts with sodium hydrogen sulfide. Also, the pentaacetate derivative of glucose does not react with hydroxylamine. 
This further suggests that there is no free CHO group in glucose. Another observation is that glucose is found to exist in two isomeric forms, alpha and beta. The alpha form has a melting point of 419 Kelvin. It is obtained by crystallizing glucose from a concentrated solution at 303 Kelvin. The beta form has a slightly higher melting point of 423 Kelvin. It is obtained by crystallizing glucose from a hot, saturated aqueous solution at 371 Kelvin. In order to explain these observations, which are not consistent with the open chain structure, a ring structure was proposed for glucose. The work done by many chemists helped establish the cyclic structure of glucose. It accounts for all the objections against the open chain structure. Since the ring structure has no free aldehyde group, glucose does not respond to certain characteristic tests of aldehydes, like Schiff's test and addition reaction with sodium bisulfite. On the other hand, typical aldehydic reactions such as the formation of cyanohydrin and oxime, which involve the attack of HCN and NH2OH, is presumably due to the open chain structure of glucose that is formed by the opening of the ring. The ring opens when these strong reagents attack it. The cyclic structure is attributed to the formation of hemiacetyl from the reaction between the aldehydic group and the C5 hydroxyl group present within the same molecule. The cyclic structure thus formed is a six-membered ring. This cyclic structure was experimentally elucidated by Hayworth and further confirmed by X-ray analysis. This cyclic structure has one chiral center more than the open chain structure. Therefore, two possible isomeric forms are possible as shown here. These two isomers differ in the configuration of the hydroxyl group at C1. Stereoisomers that differ in the configuration at C1 are known as anomers. C1 is called the anomeric carbon. Note that it is the aldehyde carbon before cyclization. The six-membered ring structures of glucose can be called pyranose structures, in analogy with pyrin. Pyrin is a six-membered heterocyclic compound. Hence, the anomers are called alpha D plus glucopyranose and beta D plus glucopyranose. Note that the hydroxyl groups on the right side and the left side in the Fisher projection formula are directed below and above the plane of the ring, respectively, in Hayward structures. Also, the terminal CH2OH is always projected above the plane of the ring. Let's direct our attention to the functional isomer of glucose that is, fructose, another important monosaccharide. Like glucose, fructose has the molecular formula C6H12O6. Fructose is readily soluble in water. It is the sweetest of all sugars. It is obtained by the hydrolysis of sucrose with glucose. The chemical equation corresponding to this reaction is as shown. 
Certain characteristic reactions of fructose show that it is a ketone and consists of six carbon atoms in a straight chain with the keto functional group at position 2 of the carbon chain. Unlike glucose, fructose is observed to be levorotatory, that is, it rotates plane polarized light towards the left. In fact, an old name for fructose is levulose. Does the fructose structure illustrated here belong to the D or L series of sugars? As fructose can be chemically correlated to dextrorotatory glucose with D configuration, it also belongs to the D series. Hence, fructose is levorotatory with D configuration. Its open chain structure along with the name D minus fructose is illustrated here. As the open chain structure fails to explain certain facts like its existence in two isomeric forms and the formation of hydrogen sulfide addition product, the ring structure was established. The cyclic structure is obtained when the hydroxyl group at C5 gets added to the carbonyl group at C2. The cyclic structure thus obtained is a five-membered ring. This structure has one chiral center more than the open chain structure. Therefore, there are two possible isomeric forms as shown here. The two cyclic forms differ in the configuration of the hydroxyl group at C2. These isomers are called anomers. The five-membered ring structure of fructose is called furanose. In analogy with furan. Furan is a five-membered heterocyclic compound. The furan molecule contains four carbon atoms and one oxygen atom. The cyclic structures of the two anomers are named alpha D minus fructofuranose and beta D minus fructofuranose. Disaccharides are carbohydrates that yield two monosaccharide units on hydrolysis. The hydrolysis of a disaccharide may yield two molecules of the same or different monosaccharide. In disaccharides, the two monosaccharide units combine and result in the formation of an oxide linkage with the elimination of a water molecule. For example, sucrose with two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose, joined together by an oxide linkage is shown in the structure here. Such a linkage formed when the hydroxyl group of the hemiacetyl carbon of one monosaccharide condenses with the hydroxyl group of another monosaccharide is called glycosidic linkage. In other words, a linkage between two monosaccharide units through an oxygen atom is called glycosidic linkage. The three most important disaccharides are sucrose, maltose and lactose. Let us now focus our attention on their structural aspects. The well-known disaccharide plus sucrose or table sugar is obtained from sugarcane or sugar beets. It has the molecular formula C12H22O11. The hydrolysis of sucrose yields an equimolecular mixture of D plus glucose and D minus fructose. Solutions of sucrose are dextrorotatory, but when sucrose is hydrolyzed, it becomes levorotatory. There is an explanation for this anomaly. The optical rotation of D glucose 
is found to be plus 52.7 degrees and that of deep fractals is minus 92.4 degrees. That is, deep glucose is dextro-rotatory with an optical rotation of 52.7 degrees while deep fractals is levorotatory with an optical rotation of 92.4 degrees. As the magnitude of levorotation of fractals is greater than the magnitude of dextro-rotation of glucose, the mixture obtained by the hydrolysis of sucrose is levorotatory. The sign of optical rotation changes from dextro-rotatory to levorotatory during the process of hydrolysis. This is called the inversion of sugar. The levorotatory mixture, which is a mixture of equimolar glucose and fructose obtained from the hydrolysis of dextro-rotatory sucrose, is called invert sugar. Invert sugar is the main ingredient of honey. Let's look at the structure of sucrose in greater detail. Sucrose is made up of one unit of glucose, specifically the alpha anormal alpha D glucopyranose, and one unit of fructose, specifically the beta anormal beta D fructofuranose. These two hexose units are joined by a glycosidic linkage that is formed between the C1 of alpha D glucopyranose and the C2 of beta D fructofuranose. Note that the loss of a water molecule results in the formation of 1 2 glycosidic linkage or alpha beta glycosidic linkage. Thus, the two carbonyl functional groups of glucose and fructose are blocked with the formation of glycosidic linkage. As the reducing group is necessary to give Tollens and Fellings tests, is involved in the formation of the glycosidic linkage, sucrose gives a negative test with these reagents. Hence, sucrose is called a non-reducing sugar. Maltose is another important disaturide which contains two glucose units. Its molecular formula is C12H22O11. It is the least common naturally occurring disaturide. It is found in germinating grain. The glycosidic linkage in maltose is formed between the carbonyl group of the C1 of alpha-D glucose and the hydroxyl group of the C4 of the second alpha-D glucose. The availability of a free aldehyde group at the C1 of the second glucose in its solution allows the maltose to reduce Tollens and Fellings reagents. Hence, maltose, unlike sucrose, is a reducing sugar. Lactose is a disaturide present in milk. So, it is sometimes referred to as milk sugar. Lactose is composed of beta-D-galactose and beta-D-glucose. The glycosidic linkage in lactose forms between the C1 of galactose and the C4 of glucose. Like maltose, lactose is a reducing sugar due to the presence of a free aldehyde group at the C1 of the glucose unit. Can you answer this question on your own? What are the products expected when lactose is hydrolyzed? Lactose would produce galactose and glucose in equal proportions. Here, we see the Hayworth projections of lactose and the hydrolysis products. Polysaturides contain many monosaturide units joined together by glycosidic linkages. Polysaturides are the most common naturally occurring carbohydrates. A polysaturide has the general formula C6H10O5 taken n times. They play important roles in food storage and as structural material. 
reduced cellulose and starch are the most important polysaccharides. Starch is the main storage polysaccharide of plants. Starch is found in cereals, roots, tubers and some vegetables and is used as an important dietary source for human beings. Chemically, starch is a polymer of the alpha isomer of D plus glucose. It consists of two components, amylose, which makes up 20% of starch, and amylopectin, which makes up the remaining 80%. These two components differ in their molecular size and shape. Amylose is the water-soluble portion of starch. Amylose molecules contain 200 to 1000 alpha D plus glucose units connected by C1, C4 glycosidic bonds as shown in the illustration. The chains of amylose are long and unbranched. Amylopectin, the major component of starch, is insoluble in water. Amylopectin is a branched chain polymer of D-glucose units. The branched structure consists of several hundred short chains of about 20 to 25 D-glucose units each. An amylopectin molecule may contain as many as 1 million glucose units. The main chain of amylopectin contains alpha-1 4 linkages between the glucose units, while branching occurs by alpha-1-6 linkages, that is, C1 to C6 glycosidic linkages. Consider the illustrations here. Which one best represents amylose? Which one best represents amylopectin? You just learned that amylose is an unbranched chain, whereas amylopectin is branched. Therefore, picture A shows amylopectin with its branched chains. Picture B shows amylose. Note that the unbranched chains of amylose often adopt helical structures. Cellulose is another important polysaccharide. Found exclusively in plants, it is the most abundant of all carbohydrates. Cellulose is the chief structural material in plants. It is completely insoluble in water. Cellulose is a straight chain polysaccharide. It is made up of chains of beta-D-glucose units. These beta-D-glucose units are joined by glycosidic linkages between the C1 of one glucose unit and the C4 of the next. These are also called beta-1-4 linkages. Humans cannot digest cellulose as they don't have the enzymes necessary to do so. Cows, horses, goats, have symbiotic bacteria in their intestinal tracts. These bacteria provide the enzymes for breaking down cellulose. The term dietary fiber refers to cellulose. The polysaccharide, glycogen, is the form in which carbohydrates are stored in animals. It is present in the liver, muscles, and brain. Glycogen is also found in yeast and fungi. The structural aspects of glycogen are much similar to amylopectin, a component of starch. Hence, it is referred to as animal starch. The structure of glycogen differs from that of amylopectin in that the molecules of glycogen have a greater degree of branching.
Enzymes break down glycogen that is stored in the liver and muscles into glucose when the body needs it. Now let us study briefly the importance of carbohydrates in our lives. Carbohydrates are a very important class of biomolecules. They form a major component of our diet. They function as storage molecules, starch in plants and glycogen in animals. The cell walls of bacteria and plants are made of cellulose. Carbohydrates have many uses as structural material. We build houses and furniture and other useful items from wood which is 40 to 50 percent cellulose. We clothe ourselves in cotton and linen which are largely cellulose. Carbohydrates provide the basis for a variety of industries including textiles, paper, lacquers and breweries. Carbohydrates have a number of important biological roles. The sugars D-ribose and 2-deoxy-D-ribose are components of nucleic acids. Glycoproteins and glycolipids, that is proteins and lipids with attached carbohydrate groups, carry out a variety of important biochemical functions. The word protein is derived from the Greek word proteos, which means primary or of prime importance. Proteins have a number of important biological roles, both structural and functional. They are vital for the growth and maintenance of the body. The dietary sources of protein include milk, cheese, pulses, such as beans and lentils, peanuts, fish and meat. Proteins are polymers of alpha amino acids. Now, what are amino acids? Let us understand. Amino acids are compounds that have one or more amino groups and carboxylic groups in a molecule. On the basis of the relative position of the amino group with respect to the carboxyl group, amino acids are classified into alpha, beta, gamma and so on. Examples of each class are shown here. In alpha amino acids, the amino group is present on the alpha carbon atom. Similarly, in beta and gamma amino acids, the amino group is present on the beta and gamma carbon atom respectively. An alpha amino acid is illustrated here. R represents the side chain. Alpha amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Only alpha amino acids are found in naturally occurring proteins. There are 20 odd alpha amino acids as shown in the table. In nature, 20 odd different amino acids combine in different ways to form different protein molecules. Every alpha amino acid has a common name. These common names reflect either the source or the property of that compound. Alpha amino acids are usually represented by a three-letter symbol and sometimes by a one-letter symbol. For example, the amino acid glycine has a sweet taste. Its name is derived from the Greek word glycos, which means sweet. The three-letter code for glycine is GLY and its one-letter symbol is G. The side chain of glycine is a hydrogen atom. The amino acid triosine was first obtained from cheese. Its name is derived 
from the Greek word tyros, which means cheese. The side chain for tyrosine contains an aromatic phenol group. It has the three-letter symbol TYR and its one-letter symbol is Y. Among the natural amino acids, the ones that can be synthesized in the body are called non-essential amino acids, whereas those that cannot be synthesized in the body and therefore must be included in the diet are called essential amino acids. Some examples of non-essential amino acids are alanine, serine and tyrosine. While examples of essential amino acids are histidine, tryptophan and methionine. Amino acids can be classified as acidic, basic or neutral on the basis of their nature. An amino acid is acidic if it contains more carboxylic groups than amino groups. It is a basic amino acid if it contains more amino groups than carboxylic groups. Neutral amino acids contain an equal number of amino and carboxylic groups. Can you classify these amino acids as acidic, basic or neutral? Look carefully at the structures. Molecules A and E, which are aspartic acid and glutamic acid, are acidic. Each has two carboxylic groups and one amino group. Molecules B and C, which are arginine and lysine, are basic. They have multiple amino groups but only one carboxylic group. Molecule D, the amino acid valine, is neutral. It has one amino group and one carboxylic group. Let us now study the physical properties of amino acids. In general, amino acids in their pure states are colorless, crystalline solids. They are water-soluble with high melting points. Most amino acids behave like salts rather than like simple amines or simple carboxylic acids. Their behavior like salts is attributed to the presence of both the acidic carboxylic group and basic amino group in the same molecule. In aqueous solutions, the acidic carboxylic group of an amino acid transfers a proton or a hydrogen ion to the basic amino group present in the same molecule. This results in the formation of a dipolar ion called a Zwitter ion. Thus, amino acids form Zwitter ions in aqueous solutions. Zwitter ions are electrically neutral. They exhibit amphoteric behavior as they can react with both acids and bases. The high melting points and solubility of most amino acids are due to this dipolar ion structure. All alpha or naturally occurring amino acids, with the exception of glycine, are optically active due to the presence of an asymmetric alpha carbon. Glycine does not have an asymmetric carbon and is therefore not optically active. All amino acids except glycine are chemically correlated to level rotatory glyceraldehyde with L configuration. Hence, amino acids have the configuration L. Notice that in L configurations the amino group is drawn on the left. Proteins are a class of biologically important compounds. 
they are condensation polymers of about 20 different alpha amino acids which are linked by peptide bonds. A peptide bond is formed when the amino group of one amino acid molecule interacts with a carboxyl group of another amino acid molecule. This reaction involves the elimination of a water molecule. Thus, the interaction between the amino group and the carboxyl group of two of the same or of different amino acids results in the formation of an amide linkage. That is, an NHC double bond O group called a peptide linkage. The product formed when two amino acids interact is called a dipeptide. The name dipeptide indicates a peptide bond that is formed between two amino acid molecules. For example, when glycine combines with alanine, a dipeptide glycylalanine is formed. Similarly, when two glycine molecules combine, glycylglycine is formed. Note that, by convention, the amino end is shown on the left and the carboxyl group is on the right of the resulting dipeptide. Also note that the peptide bond is planar. The CON and H atoms are all in the same plane along with the alpha carbons. Let's work on a practice problem. Show the formation of the peptide bond that forms between alanine and serine. Keep the amino acids in the order given here. It may help to start with the peptide backbone. Then look up the side chains and include them in the correct order. The alanine serine represented as aliser dipeptide results. Three amino acids linked by two peptide linkages are called tripeptides. The tripeptide glutathione protects the cells from oxidizing agents. It is formed from glutamic acid, cysteine and glycine. Similarly, when four, five, or six amino acids are linked, the products obtained are called tetrapeptide, pentapeptide and hexapeptide respectively. When more than 10 amino acids are linked, the product obtained is called a polypeptide. Thus, depending upon the number of amino acid residues present per molecule, Peptides are classified into dipeptide, tripeptide, tetrapeptide and so on up to polypeptides. Polypeptide chains that have either more than 100 amino acid residues with a molecular mass greater than 10,000 or less than 100 amino acid residues with a well-defined conformation are referred to as proteins. Let us now look at the classification of proteins. On the basis of molecular shape, proteins are broadly classified into two classes, fibrous proteins and globular proteins. In fibrous proteins, the polypeptide chains are long and thread-like and run parallel to each other to form fibers. These parallel chains are held together by hydrogen bonds and disulfide linkages. Due to their strong intermolecular forces of attraction, fibrous proteins are generally insoluble in water. 
Important examples of fibrous proteins include keratin, found in hair, nails, skin, etc. Myosin, found in muscles. Collagen, found in tendons. And fibroin, found in silk. Thus, these proteins form the structural material of animal tissues. In globular proteins, the polypeptide chains coil around to give a roughly spherical shape. These are soluble in water due to the presence of hydrophilic groups. Globular proteins maintain and regulate life processes. For example, insulin regulates the blood sugar levels in the body. Hemoglobin and albumin are some other examples. Let us now discuss the three-dimensional structure of proteins. The structure of proteins is studied at four different levels in the ascending order of their complexity as primary, secondary, tertiary and the quaternary structure. Let us first discuss the primary structure of proteins. The specific sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain reflects the primary structure of proteins. Here, we see the specific arrangement of amino acids of the enzyme, lysozyme. Every protein has its own unique amino acid sequence. Any change in the sequence of amino acids creates an altogether different protein. The secondary structure of proteins refers to the arrangement of the polypeptide chains in space. One important type of secondary structure is the alpha helix, illustrated here in a ribbon diagram. Each polypeptide chain is coiled to form a spiral structure called alpha helix. The alpha helix is a right-handed helical chain in which the hydrogen bonding occurs between different pairs of the chain to hold the helix together. The hydrogen bonds occur between the oxygen atom of the carbonyl group of one amino acid residue and the hydrogen atom of the NH group of a different amino acid residue on the adjacent turn of the helix, as shown here. Another common secondary structure in proteins is referred to as beta pleated sheet structure. The beta pleated sheet is nowadays referred to as the beta structure. The arrows in the ribbon structure here show the beta structure. The contraction of the peptide chains results in a pleated sheet. The chains lie side by side and are held together by hydrogen bonds. Such a structure is called a beta structure or arrangement. The tertiary structure of proteins describes the further folding of the secondary structure. The tertiary arrangement of helices and sheets is held together by hydrogen bonding, disulfide linkages, van der Waals forces and electrostatic forces of attraction. Shown here is the tertiary structure of proteins. The further folding of the secondary structure gives rise to two major molecular shapes, fibrous and globular proteins. Let us now look at the quaternary structure. Some proteins consist of multiple polypeptide chains called subunits. The quaternary structure describes how the subunits are arranged in space relative to one another in the complete protein. Hemoglobin is an important example. 
as shown in the illustration, the four protein chains of hemoglobin are arranged in a compact bundle. A protein found in a biological system with a unique structure and biological activity is referred to as a native protein. In some respects, proteins are rather fragile. Temperature or pH changes can cause a disruption of the hydrogen bonds. When hydrogen bonds break, the globules unfold, the helices unravel and the beta sheets flatten out. This is called protein denaturation. When proteins denature, the primary structure, the specific amino acid sequence, remains intact. However, the secondary and tertiary structures come apart. Denatured proteins are unable to carry out their biological function. If you have ever boiled an egg, you might have witnessed protein denaturation as the egg white solidifies. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions, speeding up the reaction rate. Enzymes speed up reaction rates by reducing the activation energy. Most enzymes are globular proteins. Enzymes catalyze specific reactions regulating a variety of functions in the body. Enzymes are exquisitely sensitive, acting only on a certain substrate or class of substrates. Most enzyme names contain the suffix ACE. Enzymes may be named after the substrate they act on. For example, the enzyme maltase catalyzes the hydrolysis of maltose to form two molecules of glucose. Alternatively, enzymes may be named after the reaction they carry out. Dehydrogenases or oxidases carry out redox reactions. Isomerases catalyze isomerization reactions. Hydrolases make hydrolysis reactions faster. The organic substances that we need in small amounts in our diet and whose deficiency leads to specific diseases are called vitamins. When vitamins were first identified, they were found to have amino groups. Thus, the word vitamin originated from vital plus amine. However, nowadays, most known vitamins don't necessarily contain amino groups. Hence, the word vitamin has been replaced by vitamin. Vitamins perform specific biological functions. They are essential for proper growth and to carry out many vital functions of the body. Most vitamins are involved in utilizing the major nutrients like proteins, fats and carbohydrates. That is why a diet deficient in vitamins leads to specific diseases. Note that High doses of vitamins can also lead to health problems. Check with your doctor before taking vitamins. When vitamins were first discovered, their chemical nature was not completely known. Therefore, they were named after the alphabets A, B, C, D and so on. Later, the chemical nature of vitamins was established and therefore 
Now they are referred to by their chemical names such as retinol, thiamine, riboflavin, ascorbic acid, shoal calciferol, and so on. However, the vitamins are now referred to by their alphabetical nomenclature also. Let us now look at the classification of vitamins on the basis of their solubility. Vitamins are typically classified into two groups based on their solubility in fat or water fat soluble vitamins and water soluble vitamins. Fat soluble vitamins are soluble in fats or oils. They are stored in the liver and adipose or fat storing tissues. Vitamins A D, E and K are fat soluble vitamins. On the other hand, water soluble vitamins are soluble in water. They are readily excreted and therefore cannot be stored or accumulated in the body. They must be a regular part of your diet. B group vitamins and vitamin C are water soluble vitamins. Let us study some important aspects of vitamins with respect to their sources and the diseases that their deficiency cause. Vitamin A is an important fat soluble vitamin. The deficiency of vitamin A leads to xerophthalmia, that is, night blindness, in which the central portion of the eye, the cornea, becomes opaque and soft. Images of xerophthalmia are quite disturbing. Vitamin D is another important fat soluble vitamin. Your skin produces vitamin D when exposed to sunlight. Food sources of vitamin D include fish and egg yolk. This vitamin is required for bone growth and calcium metabolism. Vitamin D deficiency leads to rickets, that is, bone deformities in children, including soft and weaker bones. In adults, this is called osteomalacia, characterized by soft bones and joint pains. Another important fat soluble vitamin is vitamin E. Dietary sources of vitamin E include vegetable oils and cereal grains. Vitamin E deficiency leads to more fragile red blood cells and muscular weakness. Vitamin K is another important fat soluble vitamin. Green leafy vegetables are good dietary sources of vitamin K. Vitamin K deficiency leads to slower blood clotting. Vitamin C or ascorbic acid is an important water soluble vitamin. Dietary sources of vitamin C include citrus fruits, amla, and green leafy vegetables. This vitamin is required for the synthesis of collagen and for the calcification of the bones and the teeth. Vitamin C deficiency causes scurvy, characterized by bleeding gums, deformity in bones, etc. B group vitamins are another group of water soluble vitamins. They are found in meat products, whole grains, milk and yeast. They are essential for metabolism 
and the proper utilization of energy sources like carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. B group vitamins include vitamin B1, vitamin B2, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12. Vitamin B1 or thiamine was the first vitamin to be discovered. The richest source of this vitamin is yeast and the outer layers of cereals like rice, wheat and millets. A deficiency of this vitamin causes beriberi which is associated with loss of appetite and retarded growth. Vitamin B2 or riboflavin is mostly found in milk and milk products, eggs, liver, green leafy vegetables, pulses, wheat and so on. Insufficient vitamin B2 leads to chi losses which is characterized by fissuring at the corners of the mouth and lips digestive problems and burning sensation in the skin. Vitamin B6 or peridoxine is found in meat, liver, egg yolk, cereals, grains and vegetables. Its deficiency causes convulsions. Vitamin B12 or cobalamine is found in meat, fish, egg and curd. Its deficiency leads to pernicious anemia, that is, RBC deficient in hemoglobin. Nucleic acids are biomolecules present in all living cells and are responsible for transmitting genetic information from one generation to the next. In other words, they are the carriers of heredity. They are found to exist along with certain proteins. Proteins, along with the nucleic acids, constitute nucleoproteins. Now, in this context, let us look at the chemical composition and structure of nucleic acids. The basic components of nucleic acids include a pentose sugar, a phosphate group and nitrogen containing heterocyclic compounds called nitrogen bases. Depending on the type of the pentose sugar present, nucleic acids can be broadly classified into DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA, ribonucleic acid. Examine structures 1 and 2 given here. From the structures, we can say that in DNA, the sugar is beta D2 deoxyribose. Whereas in RNA, the sugar is beta D ribose. Let us now look at how these two nucleic acids differ with respect to nitrogen bases. There are four nitrogenous bases present in DNA. Adenine guanine, cytosine and thymine. There are also four bases in RNA. In RNA, the base uracil is substituted for thymine. Note the structural similarities between adenine and guanine and between cytosine, thymine and uracil. On the basis of the structural similarities 
among the nitrogen bases. They are broadly categorized into purines and pyrimidines. Adenine and guanine are purines, while cytosine, thymine and uracil are pyrimidines. A nitrogenous base attached to the C1 prime carbon of the sugar is called a nucleoside or a base sugar unit. The nucleoside adenosine is shown here. Note that we number the sugar carbons in nucleosides as 1 prime, 2 prime and so on as shown. A pentose sugar with the nitrogen base at the C1 prime carbon and a phosphate group at the C5 prime position is called a nucleotide. A base sugar phosphate unit. Look at the structure of a nucleotide of DNA and RNA. You can see that there is only one hydroxyl group attached to the sugar ring of DNA while there are two hydroxyl groups attached to the sugar ring of RNA. Try to answer this question on your own before checking the answer. What products would be formed when a nucleotide from RNA which contains cytosine is hydrolyzed? Start with the correct nucleotide structure. Hydrolysis of this nucleotide would produce phosphoric acid, beta-D-ribose and cytosine. Nucleotides are linked together by phosphodiester linkages. These nucleotides, which are linked by phosphate ester bonds, connect the 5' phosphate group to the hydroxyl group of the sugar at the 3' prime position, as shown in the diagram. The backbone of a polynucleotide chain is a repeating sequence of sugar phosphate. The sequence of nucleotides in the chain of a nucleic acid is the primary structure of the nucleic acid DNA or RNA. The sequence in which the four nitrogen bases are attached to the sugar phosphate backbone of a DNA strand is called the primary structure of DNA. DNA forms a secondary structure in the form of a double-stranded helix, like a twisted ladder. Two strands of DNA interact to form the double helix, where the sugar phosphate backbone form the rails of the ladder, while pairs of nitrogenous bases, either purines or pyrimidines, form the rugs or steps of the ladder. James Watson and Francis Crick determined the double helix nature of DNA using X-ray crystallographic data collected by Rosalind Franklin. The two strands of DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds between specific pairs of bases. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Cytosine always pairs with guanine. As the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds, between specific pairs of bases. The strands are said to be complementary to each other. Notice that the complementary strands run in opposite directions. Let's look at the nucleotide pairing in greater detail. A purine base of one strand 
is paired with a pyrimidine base on the other strand. Two hydrogen bonds are formed when adenine pairs up with thymine. When a guanine base pairs with cytosine, three hydrogen bonds form between the bases. Try to answer this question on your own before checking the answer. In RNA, which nitrogenous bases form hydrogen bonds with uracil? The structure of uracil is shown here. Notice the structural similarities between uracil and thymine. Therefore, in RNA, uracil forms a complementary base pair with adenine. Two hydrogen bonds are present between the bases. Can you answer this question on your own? Given here is the sequence of nucleotides in a strand of DNA. What is the nucleotide sequence in the complementary strand? Remember that the complementary strand runs in the opposite direction and that T pairs with A while C pairs with G. Therefore, the sequence of the complementary strand can be readily worked out. While DNA is found as a double helix, RNA is single-stranded. The strand may fold back on itself to form helical motifs, such as stem loops or hairpin structures. There are three important types of RNA in living systems. Messenger RNA carries genetic information from DNA to ribosomes for the synthesis of proteins. Transfer RNA brings amino acids to the messenger RNA. Ribosomal RNA is the RNA component of the ribosome where proteins are synthesized in the cell. Nucleic acids play a number of important biological roles. They are the chemical basis of heredity, storing genetic information while also allowing for changes between generations. Each species has a unique genetic code with a specific number of chromosomes. DNA copies itself or self-replicates during cell division so that identical copies of the genetic code are transferred to the daughter cells. Nucleic acids are vital for protein synthesis. DNA stores the code for the amino acid sequence while RNA molecules link the amino acids together. Each individual has a unique DNA sequence. Information regarding the sequence of bases on DNA is called DNA fingerprinting. Through DNA fingerprinting, it is possible to determine if two samples of DNA belong to the same person, two related individuals, or to unrelated people. DNA fingerprinting has important uses in identifying criminals, in determining paternity, identifying accident victims, and in the study of evolutionary changes. Based on the data shown, did any of the suspects leave DNA behind at the crime scene? Based on the DNA fingerprinting, we can eliminate suspects 1 and 3 as their patterns do not match the DNA found at the crime scene. It seems likely, however, 
that suspect too may have been at the crime scene.